Hello and welcome to this webinar on pressure testing on farm grain storage. Uh, my name is Chris Warwick. I'm a consultant based in Horsham, Victoria. I manage the GRDC's grain storage extension project uh, and I now service the GRDC southern region with grain storage workshops and information. Um, I trust you well um, and if there is something that you have more questions on please feel free to contact the grain storage extension team. Um, you can phone them on 1800 Weevil email info at storedgrain.com.au or go to the website storedgrain.com.au for more information. Uh, I'd like to thank the BCG, the Birch Cropping Group, for hosting the webinar today uh, and recording it for us so you can watch it at a later date. Let's get into it. First question, why bother with pressure testing? Um, what, why do we even need to do a pressure test on a silo? Um, why is it required? I think it's good to understand um, what we're actually trying to do um, when we're killing insects. We all think about the adult insect um, in, in the live stage um, because the adult's the one we see. The adult's the one that we get pinged for if we're trying to deliver grain um, with insects in it. So that's, that's the main target. But what we often forget about is there's, there's a whole life cycle, the egg, the larvae and the pupae. And when we use um, fumigants like phosphine, we want to kill the whole life cycle, not just the adults. Um, what happens if we only kill the adults is that we end up with egg larvae pupae surviving that fumigation and they survive it then with an added level of resistance. And that's, that's how we breed resistance quite quickly, by doing fumigations where we might kill a few of the adults or a lot of the adult insects, but we don't kill the whole life cycle. The whole life cycle. So how do we do that? It requires an adequate concentration of gas over time. For phosphine, uh, that's 300 parts per million for seven days. Or it's, if the grain's cooler, it's 200 parts per million for 10 days. That's the concentration required to kill the whole life cycle of, of the, the main grain storage pests. The reason for that is in the life cycle, here you can see the egg and the pupae are quite dormant. So they're not active, they're not taking in the phosphine. So we have to hold the gas there long enough for them to start develop the pupae to an adult, the egg to a larvae. They start developing, become more active and actually take the gas in. So if you hear people say, oh, I just put more phosphine in, I, I do other things to try and make it react quicker. It's actually not so much about the dose. Of course, the dose has to be right, but increasing the dose won't give you a better result. You actually have to hold that that concentration of gas for a long enough period of time, that's seven to 10 days. And that's the same for any gas, whether we're using a, a profume or a, a controlled atmosphere like carbon dioxide or nitrogen, um, we have to hold a, an adequate con concentration for the required period of time. That's what it's all about. And that's why we talk about gas tight storage. And so we do a pressure test to test if that storage is actually gas tight. Is it likely to hold that gas concentration for the amount of time we need it to. That's the whole reason behind the pressure test. I mentioned resistance. This is the map of Australia at the moment, thanks to the, the team that do the resistance monitoring for us. Um, these little dots around the country here is where resistance has already been detected. And it's, it's really obvious that, that, that every time this map gets updated, there's more dots on it, surprise, surprise. So we really do need to, um, to start using phosphine um, only in gas type storage so that we can maintain the life of phosphine. At the moment, it's the cheapest form of fumigant that we can use on farm. If we, if we continue using phosphine incorrectly, it will soon become useless and we'll then have to pay, our only option will be a commercial fumigator to come and phosphine with another, to, to come and fumigate with another gas, um, which is not a bad idea, Good, good idea to get a commercial fumigator and, and rotate your chemistry, um, use a different product like Profume or something like that, um, so that you're not always relying on phosphine. But be aware that as soon as you've got to pay someone else to come and do a fumigation, it's likely to be more expensive. So the longer we can keep phosphine in the rotation, um, the better we are able to uh, control um, pests in our grain storage cost effectively. What does all that mean um, actually in a silo? So we talked about the, uh, 
the two to 300 parts per million. Here's the 300 parts per million on our graph here. This research done by uh, the post Harvest research team in Queensland demonstrates what happens to the gas levels in a silo that meets a three and a half minute half-life pressure test. And I'll, and I'll explain what a half-life pressure test is in, is in just a moment. But this is a gas level on day zero. At the top of the silo, the blue line, the middle of the silo, the yellow line there, and the bottom of the silo, the green line. So you can see in this silo that met a half-life pressure test, took us about a day, day and a half, for the gas to reach all parts of the silo. But once it did, it was well above our target concentration of 300 parts per million for our seven to 10 days. So that's obviously going to be a successful fumigation. Let's compare that now to the same silo right beside it, and the seal on this silo was compromised just slightly. So they could still do a pressure test, but it only did an eight second half-life pressure test, not a three and a half minute. So a lot of people would talk about this silo being sealed or semi-sealed or fumigatable terminology like that. It, it is pretty well sealed, to be honest. Um, only a small compromise in one of the seals or two of the seals. And you can see the gas level concentrations here were vastly different. The top of the silo, yes, it got over our concentration, but it came down pretty quick within five days. The middle of the silo didn't even reach our 300 parts per million. And the bottom of the silo, the gas hardly even registered because it leaked out of the silo before it could actually reach the, the target concentration. And we certainly, um, we could put more gas in, we could put more phosphine in, and what would happen is we'll get a big spike up here and then it will drop right back, back down just as quick and we don't get that concentration over time. So rather than um, everyone on farm go and put gas lines in their silo and monitor the gas concentration, this simple pressure test is the way to figure out how, that you're likely to get a good gas concentration over time um, and, and be confident that your fumigation is going to be successful and that you won't breed resistance. That's why we do a pressure test. So what is a pressure test? Many of you will already have heard about it, uh, may have even done them. Pressure test requires a gas type storage, of course. Um, if it's gas type storage, it will need a pressure relief valve. Now that pressure relief valve serves two purposes. One is to protect the silo when it is sealed so that some expansion and contraction can happen when the air inside the silo heats up and cools down. There's gotta be some pressure relief valve there. And it also allows us to do our pressure test. So in our pressure relief valve here, um, in the one pictured, we wanna make sure that oil levels are, are equal at the start and at the, on the middle line. So we start with the oil levels equal at the middle. We pressurize the silo to create a difference in oil levels of 25 mil or one inch. So pressurize the silo, it'll push the oil down on this side of the gauge, up on this side till they're an inch apart, 25 mil apart. Then we take the pressure off, make sure the silo is sealed up, but we don't, we don't add any more pressure. And then we time how long it takes for that oil level to fall from 25 mil apart back to 12 mil apart. Hence the half-life pressure test. So it's halfway back. For a new silo, that needs to take no less than five minutes. For an existing silo, we know three minutes will equal the gas concentration we need. So let, let me explain that in a bit more detail. Pressure relief valves, first thing first, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, from the one on the left here, very similar to what I, I just showed you. Um, quite a small, only suited to a small silo. Um, th there's one here in the middle, a bit larger size, that lets more volume of air through for a larger silo. Um, they all effectively do the same thing. The one on the top right here, a, a YouTube, they're quite common now on the, the transportable size silos um, that might have a thermosiphon or some plumbing up the side of the silo. They're still doing exactly the same thing. You can see the marks on them here. We've got a, a level mark and then we've got a high, uh, an inch apart mark. Um, on the bottom right here, it's actually the, the exact same pressure relief valve as the middle, but it's just two of them. So this is a big flat bottom silo, needs more pressure relief capacity because the bigger the silo the more air volume the bigger the difference in pressure as the temperatures change and then we'll talk about temperature change the ambient temperature 
if, if the, the outside temperature heats up, or if the air inside the silo has to expand, it needs to escape somewhere. Likewise, if the air cools down, it needs to be able to suck some air back in to, to, um, to get the pressure equilibrium back again. Otherwise, we damage our silo if we don't have one of these, if we don't have adequate pressure relief. If the silo doesn't have a pressure relief valve, it might have, it, 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 it needs one to be, to be able to be sealable. Um, it might have a pressure relief valve like this one that you can't actually see the oil in it, or it might have a pressure relief valve right at the top where you can't access it to, to actually see the oil level. So in that case, you can actually make your own very simple YouTube with a piece of, piece of hose, um, a bit of dye in water, and, and that you'll get the exact same um, result. When should we do a pressure test? What's the best time of day? I started talking about the influence of temperature. One degree difference in temperature, if the sun hits the silo, if the, if the day is still warming up, will make a significant difference to the air pressure inside the silo. So you won't get an accurate reading. So the recommendation is before dawn, before the sun hits the silo. Mid afternoon, I've given an example here of where the temperature flats off between three and six p.m. On, on this forecast to the stable ambient conditions. It's not heating, it's not cooling. The other time you can see here is between 3 and 6 a.m., which is, uh, if it was me, I'd be going for the p.m. rather than getting up at 3 a.m. to pressure test the silo. Um, so mid-afternoon on a stable or overcast day is often good, as long as it's completely overcast. And again, mid-afternoon, so the temperature is not changing too much. <coughs> Often hear about people saying, "Oh, I just uh, sealed the silo up when it was sunny, and the oil oil bath started bubbling away, so that means it's sealed." Well, no, that's not actually accurate. All that means is that the sun was heating the air inside the silo quicker than it could leak out. Doesn't give you any accurate indication. So avoid rising or falling temperatures, partial cloud cover. If the sun keeps popping out from behind a cloud, you or, or wind even wind on the silo will change the temperature of the air and give you an inaccurate reading. So first thing we start is to pressurise the silo. And I say pressurise, to get one inch water gauge, it's actually 0 0.036 of a PSI. So it's not like we're pumping up a car tyre and putting a heap of pressure in there and straining everything. It is very low pressure, 250 pascals or 0 0.036 of a PSI. So don't be worried that we're putting a heap of pressure in the silo. It's more about the volume than the pressure. So we can use an air compressor on a tubeless tyre valve. If you do that, you can screw the centre out of that, uh, that valve um, and then seal it off with a, a nice sealing steel cap. But um, it will take a while. As I said, it's more about volume and pressure. So uh, your air compressor is more about pressure than volume. So that is the one way to do it. A small aeration fan is another way to do it. I wouldn't use the big fans, but if you've got a little cone bottom silo with a small aeration fan, you can seal the silo up. You can connect the fan just for a few seconds and it will put pressure in the silo. You close the, the cover on that inlet of the fan and turn the fan off straight away so you don't damage it. But that's enough to pressurize a silo and really quick and easy. Um, the other one I, I often use and I find it easiest is a leaf blower. Uh, most silos have some sort of plumbing in them now where you can connect a leaf blower to, um, or you can make a, a fitting that you can get a leaf blower into your silo. A small cone bottom silo literally um, might be only 10, 10, 15 seconds to pressurize the silo. A big flat bottom silo with a leaf blower, you might be looking at 30 seconds, 40 seconds in an empty silo, might take a bit longer in a full silo, um, but it really is surprisingly quick with a leaf blower. Uh, a blow vac or venturi gun is another option here. One that you hook up to the air compressor and it just creates a venturi to put a, a volume of air in the silo. Another option there. Um, so it doesn't matter how you pressurize a silo, we pressurize it until we get those oil levels one inch apart or 25 mm apart. Something I, I miss saying, uh, trying to pick the right time of day to do pressure test. One way to tell is to seal your silo up as if you're going to do a pressure test and just watch these oil levels for a few minutes and see if they start to move. If they don't move, A, you either haven't got a pressurized silo, um, 
you've got a leak somewhere, or it tells you that it's stable ambient conditions and you can do a pressure test. So when you first seal your silo up to do a pressure test, before you add pressure, just watch these oil levels for a few minutes and see whether they start moving. If they start moving on you, you know that the, that the temperature is not stable and, and then you, you can't do a test. So we pressurize a silo to the oil levels, 25 mil apart. We time from that point halfway back, 12 mil apart. For a new silo, that's got to be more than five minutes. For an existing silo, we know three minutes is enough. What happens if we don't get that result? We've got to go find the leaks. Common spots we find when we're doing this, this work um, is around the hatches, of course. Um, and that could be around the bottom hatch, uh, the, the manhole, as it's called. Um, the easiest way to find it is it, it just a squirty bottle with some soapy water in it, and you'll see the air start bubbling out. So you repressurize the solo and watch for these bubbles, uh, and they'll bubble out. They'll tell you if there's a seal damaged or not sitting right. Um, sometimes if the solo doesn't have a, a way to pull that uh, manhole cover down with a bit of pressure on it, if the solo is empty, it needs a bit of pressure down on it to actually seal properly. Um, the bottom outlet plate on a silo is a common spot for leaking, um, particularly when the silo is full and there's pressure down on that, that outlet plate. Um, so that, that's a really common spot we find silos leaking. Um, the ideal systems in these cone bottoms is actually have another plate that sits over the top here as a seal plate so it doesn't have the pressure of the grain on it. Other common spots is the top lid. It's a really common one now with all the ground opening lids, which are fantastic. Um, the challenge with the ground opening lids is actually getting um, strong enough, even pressure down on that lid to hold a good seal. Um, some manufacturers will have rely on spring pressure, um, which we find is often not enough or not even enough. So you may need to add a, a turnbuckle or, or some sort of hatch to put some even pressure down on that top lid. Um, other spots, uh, aeration fan inlet covers. Um, you can see here that rubber's damaged slightly from swinging in the wind, uh, and that was enough to compromise the seal of the silo. So it doesn't take much to compromise the seal. Um, so obviously you go looking for the leaks, repair the rubbers, do what you need to do to, to, um, to fix the silo up, redo your pressure test and see if you can get it to meet that, um, that three minutes for existing silo or five minutes for a new silo. We often get asked, um, and the question may come up today again, can you retro seal a silo? Can you seal up a silo that hasn't been made sealable? It, it, it is possible, but it's very difficult. It takes a lot of work. In a lot of cases, you've actually got to cut the bottom outlet off the silo and start again to, to actually make it sealable. Um, sealing between the roof and the, the wall of the silo is also another hard spot if it wasn't designed sealable. Um, it really is a lot of work. My suggestion would be to add aeration cooling to that unsealable storage if it hasn't got it already, and then put your money towards buying some sealable silo next time you want to expand your storage. Um, it, it, money better spent, in my opinion, um, to, to actually go new. If, if you do want to use a contractor to try and retro seal a silo, insist that that silo can be pressurized, pressure tested, sorry, insist that solo can be pressure tested and meets a five minute half life before you pay that contractor's invoice. Otherwise, to be honest, it's a waste of time retro sealing a solo if they can't demonstrate a pressure test um, after they've done the job. To help us out, we've actually got an Australian standard for gas tight sealing now. So that it takes away the confusion of what one person might think is sealed versus what another person might think is sealed. So that Australian standard is 2628, and it says that the silo must meet a five minute half-life pressure test when it's new. So if you're looking at buying new storage, every manufacturer will tell you that they'll produce a sealed silo. What you need to specify is that you want a, a, a sealable silo that seals to the Australian standard 2628, and you need to get that on the invoice and then pressure test that silo when it's delivered or when it's been built. Obviously, you need to pick the right time of day to, to do that, and it might be uh, delivered late in the evening, so you can't do your pressure test then, but 
at the next opportunity time, do the pressure test on that silo before you pay the final invoice. It is really important um, to make sure manufacturers are delivering what you're paying for. To trust that that's sealable because the manufacturer said it's sealed is, is unfortunately not good enough. I see it too many times that manufacturer said it was a sealed silo, I pressure test it and it doesn't meet the pressure test. And a lot of times it's just a small adjustment or, or um, a small fix, um, but that needs to be done. You, that, that's what you've paid for, um, that needs to be checked. When should we do a pressure test? I've just alluded to one of them. When the silo is delivered uh, or, or it's finished being built, obviously you wanna do your pressure test to make sure you're getting what you've paid for. Um, annually, ideally we do a pressure test annually um, when the silos are empty so that we've got a chance to do any maintenance that might be needed, replace any seals that have, that have worn out or been damaged the previous year. Um, and then again, ideally before each fumigation, that's when we really want want the, uh, the silo to be sealable is when we're fumigating. So they're the three times that, that we really wanna do a pressure test. But of course, any time is better than no time. So I, I just encourage you to, to start doing some pressure testing on your silos. As a side point, uh, you, you might be of the understanding, and I, I commonly hear this, a misunderstanding that we buy a sealable silo to keep the insects out. Uh, and that's actually not the case. The only time we want to seal up a sealable silo is for fumigation or a pressure test. So the only time it's sealed is when we're fumigating. If we try and seal a silo all, all year round, it actually puts too much pressure on the silo um, structurally um, and, and there's really no need. You're better off letting that grain breathe and only sealing your silo when you're doing a fumigation. Just to highlight key points, um, I think I said it enough times, but I wanna make sure people understand phosphine requires a concentration over time. So adding more phosphine, doing something else nasty to the phosphine to make it go off quicker um, is not gonna get you a better result, unfortunately. You're kidding yourself. It needs that concentration over time to kill the insects at all their life stage. Pressure test is the only way to ensure gas tight storage. Um, so, so unfortunately we can't trust um, all the manufacturers to, to deliver what they say they're gonna deliver. We've got to do a, a, a pressure test there. If you're looking at new storage, insist they meet the Australian standard 2628. It's not good enough for, for a manufacturer to say the silo is sealed or sealable or fumigatable or semi-sealed or pretty well sealed, it's got to meet that Australian standard 2628. And again, I, I just said a pressure test new size before paying the final invoice. That's all for today. There's more information if you would like to look for more information on storedgrain.com.au. Um, if you go slash pressure testing, there's a fact sheet on how to do a pressure test. It goes through what we've done today. And there's even a video there of the late Peter Botter demonstrating uh, how to do a pressure test. It really doesn't take long, it's quite simple. Um, and, and often, if the silo was built to be to be gas tight, the fix will be just a, a really simple one. It, more, more times than not, it's just a matter of a, a plate um, not sitting on quite on square or a rubber seal needs replacing. So I really do encourage you to do a, a quick pressure test before you do fumigation. You have a look now if there's any questions. Um, before we finish up. Good question, you've got one. Will the times be different before fumigating compared to when the silo is empty? Good question. So if we do a pressure test when the silo is empty, it's actually easier to get a, a, a positive reading than when the silo is full of grain um, because there's more air in the side that, in, inside the silo. So, that's it's a good question because we want to do a pressure test when the silo is empty so that if there is an issue, we can actually fix it. No point finding we need to replace a rubber on a bottom outlet if the silo is full and we can't get to that outlet. So we do a pressure test when the silo is empty so we can fix it. But of course, when the silo is full, it will change the, the, the pressure on the silo, change the pressure on the, the bottom plate usually. Um, and that's the time we actually want to use a fumigation. So that's the ideal time to do a pressure test 
to see whether it is actually um, going to hold that gas for the right amount of time. Good question. If there's no more questions, um, thank you for, for tuning in today. I hope you're staying well. Um, the next webinar we've got is on the 15th of April, and that one's going to be on fumigating with phosphine. So we'll go into more detail of actually how to do a fumigation with phosphine successfully, uh, tips and tricks to, to, to get a good result there. Um, again, if you need more information or, or, or want to contact one of the grain storage extension team, 1-800-WEEVIL will put you in contact with your nearest grain storage specialist, um, or you can email us, info at storegrain.com.au. Thanks again for, uh, for tuning in.